continued with a dynastic succession in Hussein's line through um, what are known as the prime, well, the Shia three major sects. The majority are called the Twelvers because they believe there are twelve imams, twelve so-called lawgivers, not quite prophets, um, but who could speak sort of canonically, like if you're familiar to the papal like ex cathedra pronunciations. And these, there's another sect, the Seveners, known also as the Ismailis, who are led by uh, Naviaga Khan, and they believe there are seven imams, and then the Fivers, the Zaidi, primarily in Yemen, and they believe there are five. But because of them, they developed their set of laws that included most of what the Sunni, the majority, have, but also their own. The key other distinction between them, the reason that's important, besides the fact that you now have seven bodies of law, um, there, was, there were two major dis schisms, theologically, philosophically, in those formative periods, that, that affected basically the history of Islamic thought. One was the dispute between the creationists and the, and the revelationists, namely whether the Quran was like the Jewish and Christian Bibles, which, by the way, if you've ever read the Quran, the Quran refers to itself as the Second Amendment of the, the Jewish Torah, the First Amendment being the Gospel, um, and, um, or, w which, you know, as you know, unless it says in, in the Judeo-Christian Bibles, and God said, it's not supposed to be the literal word of God. The other, the revelationist, is it is the literal word of God. The revelationist won out. So every word in the Quran is deemed to be the literal word of God. That obviously has impact on how much you can interpret around it. If it's the word of God, it's immutable. It's not subject to questioning. Um, the second schism was between the traditionists and the rationalists. That is whether you could, and to Westerners, especially Western lawyers, this is sort of amazing, but there was a dispute as to whether you could use rational reasoning to determine issues that had not been set forth clearly in the Quran or the uh, things that were able to be realistically or authoritatively attributed to things that the prophet said or did or permitted, the so-called hadith or traditions. Uh, the traditionists won. Um, their political party was successful. And among the Sunni, it became uh, impermissible to use rational reasoning to settle and analyze legal issues. You had to use a process called taklis uh, and, and kios, a system where you analogize. Um, those of you who are familiar with the civil law system, it's vaguely analytic, more similar to that than what we have in the common law. But um, you had to find an authoritative tradition. And originally, there were about 500,000 traditions that were anything that the prophet or any of the 40 companions said it did. Those were winnowed down to only the true prophetic sunnah, the, the, the uh, a true prophet, of which there are about 5,000. And uh, the Shia split occurred before that. So the Shia allow reasoning. <laughs> so when you're applying Islamic law, you have the a swath of different issues, a great variety of things, and a great difference in how you can approach and solve them. Uh, the second area that they talk about, there's a, a whole appendix on this, is the area I'm more uh, familiar with, Islamic finance. And just very briefly, the hallmarks of that is that um, the Quran prohibits riba. Riba has been translated for a thousand years as interest. And I won't bother you all like I teach my Saudi Arabian lawyer students um, about all the, the permutations of that. But suffice it to say, it outlaws the paying and receiving of interest. And it is, again, because it's part of Sharia, not only uh, invalid, it's a sin. The other thing that it, it outlaws is something called harar, unquantified risk. When you think of industries built on unquantified risk, you think of things like insurance. <laughs> Uh, you can't sell next year's crops. So there's a whole body of laws and prohibitions that um, have, have dramatically limited uh, things like capital formation. Um, there's no intangible assets in Islamic finance. 
Um, there are no non-possessory liens. Uh, there are no limited liability. It's a sin not to pay your debts. Uh, and there's even a, a semi-authoritative hadith that says that your uh, inheritor successors have to pay your debts or you won't be admitted into the kingdom of heaven. So there are lots of differences, but given all those differences uh, and given the various ways that the law is created, because after those, uh, those 200 years, the law then was created uh, primarily only through consensus, through uh, the approval of the uh, scholarly group um, one difference between the Shia and the Sunni. The Sunni, once a, a decision is made, in particular if it's done by a fatwa, an edict, lasts forever. With the uh, Shia, it's only as long as the issuer is alive. That's why when Ayatollah Khomeini died, Ayatollah Khomeini had to issue a new one against Salman Rushdie. But um, they also the Shia are hierarchical. So you have Ayatollahs and you have people going under them while the Sunni are completely non-hierarchical. There's never been a Supreme Court among the Sunni. There's never been a papal curia, never been a Sanhedrin, never been a legislature. So the, the body of law uh, that is um, authoritative in one way or another, and the body of, of, of authoritative opinions in the form of fatawa, which is the plural of fatwas, is gigantic. So, you can find an authoritative, valid statement on Sharia for, I, won't, I can't say anything, but certainly everything that the center puts forth in their document. Uh, and um, while that is a much greater issue when you're talking about Islamist uh, governments in the Arab Spring and elsewhere, it isn't here. <laughs> That's the message of this panel. It isn't here. Our laws still govern. Our constitution still governs. You can't, you can't voluntarily accept involuntary servitude. You can't voluntarily agree to be the third wife. You can't voluntarily agree to be divorced because your husband said, I divorced you three times. Um, it doesn't work that way in our legal system, uh, happily. Um, and yet, there are 20 states or more in which legislation along those lines, uh, perhaps quite not as dramatic as the one in Oklahoma, where the courts have already made it clear that isn't going to work. But it's still going on, and it is nothing but misinformation and lack of information and pedagoguery. Um, and you know, the more people who are aware of the issues, the more people who are out there understanding this, and you know, it's not just it's not just the red states. There's this is a movement. It's been in the legislature in the state of New York. I don't know New Jersey or not, but um, so uh, that's probably my time. Yes. <laughs> Thank you.